Aloha, everyone. Sorry, I just turned off the music without lowering it first. <laughs> Oops. Aloha, Tammy. And anyone coming in, the lurkers too. So, part five of our SKT Revelation Deep Dive. Spirit Keepers True, for those of you who have not been following along. Um, for those of you who have, we are down to our last 12 cards. Aloha, Diane. Oh, thank you. It's new glasses. So if you uh, see me making faces, it's because I'm trying to adjust my eyes. <laughs> so let's see. The, the eights, the nines, the tens. And then we can talk about how are used for I Ching. Slay up the eights. And there will be an occasional peacock scream in the background just to warn you. Um, so here we have the eights. The realm of eights is manifestation, right? Manifesting. The realm of manifestation is the number of the universal order and said to symbolize the Aleutian mysteries. In Burmese astrology, eight symbolizes cosmic balance and energetic equilibrium. On the Kabbalistic tree of life, the realm of eight arises from the Sephirah Hod, the emanation of glory and splendor. Hermetic association for Hod relates to the emanation of intellection, communication, and analytical reasoning. Uh, Judaism connects the emanation to meditation and prayer, and in the face of obstacles and strategy, yield to faith in the divine rather than try to struggle against the conflict. Mm -hmm. Tanji says, yay, peacocks. <laughs> okay, so let's start here with the sharpshooter, the eight of, you know what, let me plug my phone in real quick. It's the secondary camera here, and doing this through StreamYard seems to bleed my phone pretty quickly. So. Let's see if that helps with the stuttering of the camera. Seems to have, well, spoke too soon. <laughs> so, sharpshooter. Today, and I'm going to use the miniature elder wand as my pointer. <laughs> so, the eight of scepters um, represents opportunities inbound, but you must meet it halfway and physically demonstrate your will. And here in the foreground, we have Artemis, Greek archer goddess of the hunt, twin sister to Apollo. Uh, she aims and shoots her silver bow, um, a gift from her father Zeus. She's wearing her signature saffron hunting tunic. Artemis was the patron goddess of Sparta. The bow Artemis here uh, is using is in the design on the mantle worn by the Gala priestess and Kitu the priestess. So I pointed that out in the priestess card in I think our first session, how uh, the wings of the bow become the mantle for the priestess. And then appearing above uh, um, Artemis is uh, Athena, goddess of wisdom and the just war, another daughter of Zeus, and patron goddess of Athens. She wields her father's Aegeus, which is uh, basically a shield, now adorned with the covered head of Medusa. She is the Athenian uh, Promachos, uh, the bronze statue upon the Acropolis, come to life. Uh, below to the left, uh, so here we have uh, city state of Athens, 
and, and Sparta here. So you can see the difference because these are kind of blue, these are kind of yellow. Um, the setting is a reimagined of the Greco-Persian wars when a longtime rivals, Athens and Sparta, set their differences aside to become allies. On Athena's Aegeus, below Medusa's head, It's getting blocked by the arrowhead, which we will come back to in a moment because that's actually an important thing, the arrowhead there. Um, but there's a Spartan, uh, yeah, you can see it. Let me see if there's a picture in the book. Um, There we go. So I do love that the book of maps gives us the details that we can't really see in the cards themselves, right? So there's the writing there. Right? So it's just below the head. <clears throat> and that's, uh, that is page 480, if you're following along. Uh, the write-up is actually on page 479 for the actual Greek, Doric Greek to be specific. Okay. Um, so it translates to either it or on it. And that is uh, basically saying I'm either going to bring back my shield, my ideas, or I'll come back on it. Come back victorious or come back dead. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, drawn on Artemis's bow is the arrow. Here, right? Why the camera is supposed to be stuttering? But the tip of the arrow here. Is actually this goddess's uh, spear tip. Uh, there's integration and collaboration of skills between the same red glow uh, that you can see in, inside. Yeah, there's a slight red glow, and that's the same Azoth light seen in the Demon, uh, Key 15, uh, also in Key 14, the Warrior, and on the Shining Gale. Yes, Roman. I know you and Medusa are connected very strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, primordial influence is uh, astrological. We have the Magus and the Angel. Numerologically, it's the Force and the Healer. It's going to be all of them, right? Uh, Mather's association is swiftness. Hello, hello. Thanks for joining. Sip, sip, everyone, while the loud airplane buzzes by. Now we have eight of chalices or the defector. The card camera seemed to be stuttering for anyone else, or is that just me that sees that? <laughs> Ooh, Deanne Blue Crescent Tura says, yes, I have a fancy coffee right now. Vanilla, marshmallow, hazelnut. Ooh, that is fancy. Sounds good. Um, I am drinking a green tea that is a blend of sencha and matcha. I'm being more into the teas like 
Let's see. So here we have a crescent moon, right? Hangs in a violet night sky. The alchemical symbol of the squared circle appears behind the moon, symbolic of the waning or darkening phase of the alchemical process for the philosophy. A migrant ascends here. The migrant here is ascending up a hill heading for the mountains. Hills represent obstacles while mountains symbolize knowledge. His staff is adorned with uh, three jewels. See the three jewels on the top of the staff. Focus. One, two, three. I'm not suggesting one who will bring in that which is precious from his old world to be integrated into the new. The three jewels also represent the alchemical tree of prima. Note that the squared circle in the moon is colored as the same as the tree of prima and the three jewels here. It's kind of hard to see on camera, but I can definitely see it into my naked eye. It's just hard to see those little jewels on there. Um, let me see if I can, if the image is a little better in the book. Yeah, you get a much larger version of the image. So you can see that he's got the three jewels and they correspond in color to the squared circle. The setting is the Near East, around 200 to 100 BC. Standing over the temple, the temple here. Standing over the temple is Thoth, or Tehuti, the Egyptian Ibis god of science, writing, magic, and art. Here, Thoth holds a, a writing reed and a scribe palette the traditional tools for writing hieroglyphs. The hieroglyphs on the crescent moon itself you can see that the moon is covered in hieroglyphs. So the hieroglyphs on the crescent moon read as follows. The Book of Holy Words, the Book of Thoth, which is the Book of Traversing Eternity. Oh, hi, little kitten. <laughs> we do them all. Yeah, there's a little too much stuff on this table for you to deal with. <laughs> mm. Special needs kitties, special needs. I think we need a little book for this one again because it's talking about something faint on his leg, which <laughs> get the bigger picture. Even here, the bigger picture can't really see writing that well. But this faintly imprinted upon his right shin where the foot appears in spirit. Merging with the temple is the higher power. Kind of see a little white glyph on his. Okay. And then upon his left shin, where the foot appears solid on the ground, is the hieroglyph for life, which is the ankh. 
which I can see down Shin there. So that one's power. That one's life. Along the bottom right corner of the card is a mermaid. The later embodiment of Atagartus, the primordial life-giving and protective mother goddess of the sea from Mesopotamia and Syrian antiquity. Her symbols are the fish and doves. You can see the dove behind the squared circle. Primordial influences here, the New World Order, the necromancer, numerologically connected to the force, the healer. Uh, Mather's attribution is abandoned success. You see the typical walking away, right? But there's so much more. <laughs> mm, thanks for the letting me know. She says that I wouldn't say stuttering for me, it's just one little pause, but that's fine. That's good to know, because for me, it's like on my camera or the, the image I'm looking at in StreamYard, it's like the, this is getting a little stuttery sometimes. I'm not sure why. Anyway, on to the next card. We have the Eight of Swords, the captor. The setting is Hellenized Alexandria, when Egypt was a Ro Roman province. The Romans pushed for Greek influences to dominate over the Egyptian in a form of cultural imperialism. In the background to the left here, stands the Great Library of Alexandria. It was not so much a single physical location and structure, but rather refers to the collection of scrolls housed in Alexandria that the cosmopolitan city became known for. The adjacent building to the right represents the uh, museum or research institute in the, uh, dedicated to the muses. Um, I will see. And then in the distance is the lighthouse of Alexandria. Here is the better image of the background without any of the foreground. So library, museum with the actual muses on top. But we'll cover that uh, near the end. And then here is the lighthouse of Alexandria. So behind her two swords, blades down. Um, they appear in the foreground, their formation reminiscent of the astrological glyph for Gemini. In front of the museum, the viewer's right side is a statue of, it's here, let me see if I can, <laughs> as I close the book. See the statue. It's the Roman god Jupiter and the golden eagle in front also signifies Jupiter and Roman rule. A woman's hands are tied by the threads of fate. Ropes extending in four directions. Not only are the swords surrounding her, Two shadowy clouds here at the bottom grip her skirts. She is Hypatia of Alexandria, upper class daughter to the Greek scholar and mathematician Theon of Alexandria. She did not come to a very pretty end. Keep in mind, this is called the Cap Tor, right? So you are actually the person standing there with her as your captor. You are the captor, right? Um, a, total, a total lunar eclipse reflecting blood red 
hanging low in the sky is bearing witness to what is about to happen. Very sad ending her that I won't go into because it is brutal and, and we don't need to go into that. Uh, Hypatia of Alexandria became a symbol of humanitas, intellectualism, culture, and the humanities. Her death is a representation of the unprincipled, ambition-driven mob seeking to suppress learning and science. Primordial influences, uh, Wheel of Life, the Lovers, numerologically, the Force, the Healer. Mathis attribution, shortened force. Two, we're following along for 90, 92. Oh, yeah, if you want to read more about her life. Huh? Section 492, um, it shows that Raphael's fresco painting of the School of Athens has her as one of the teachers. And then on the mausoleum, we have colored in the 12 muses. Next, we have the eight of orbs, the journey. So a young Muska shaman in training is honoring her craft. In front of her is her teacher's staff setting an example for her to follow as she practices casting her own orbs. The shaman in training works under the watchful tutelage of her gods. Behind her right shoulder is Chia, a diosa de la luna, or her moon goddess. And behind her left is Shue, dios del sol, her sun god. Chia is stern and holds this uh, young, uh, Injuring to high standards because that is how the little one will arrive best. Shue, on the other hand, is like a proud doting father. The backdrop is the high plateau of the Colombian Andes, home of the Mushka or Chibcha. Let me see, I think we do have a 498. There's just a uh, image of the mountains that are back behind the gods there. Uh, counted among the Aztec, Maya, and Inca, the Musca were one of the most advanced civilizations in the Americas. Uh, they were around 800 AD. Uh, the master shaman staff is used by the spiritual leaders of the Mushka chiefdoms to conjure spirits or to house auxiliary spirits. Others on her headdress, kind of hidden by this orb here, um, purify her physical body so that she can commune with the divine spirits. The gold ritual armor she wears is to protect her from evil spirits while she is in trance. The master shaman's staff is also a rattle, which the shamans use to bring fertility. The mushka were renowned for their gold metalworking and ornate artwork. A common feature in their art and carvings was the spiral. So I don't know if you've heard of the legend of uh, the Golden City, El, El Diego, El Durago, something like that. Sorry, I'm having a brain part. Um, but these people were the were where that legend came from because they they did everything in gold. They did a lot of their um, sacrifices were gold statues that were tossed into rivers and lakes and stuff. Oh, awesome. You have the deck out and you're looking with it. 
El Dorado, thank you, Tanji. On to the nines. Oh my God, we're so close to being done. Wow, and then we're gonna talk about the... Uh... So I didn't get a total chance to finish my notes, but we're gonna, at some point, we're gonna switch back to the book um, because these new glasses are progressive and I spent like the first two or three hours when I was wearing them just nauseous and not really able to focus on much of anything. But I'm getting used to them. It's still a little bizarre. <laughs> so the nines, this is the realm of nines culminating. The realm of nines is the realm of spiritual ascension. It is a realm of artists and healers. With a nine comes spiritual cultivation and karmic lessons. In the Kabbalistic tree of life, the realm of nines arises from the Sephiroth Yesod, uh, the foundation upon which God built the material world. In Hermetic Kabbalah, Yesod is the emanation of communication, connections, dream, consciousness, and the source where magic begins to take form toward manifestation. The number nine is the divine receiving completion from three triads. It is the summit of theology. So let's start here with the nine of scepters. The nine of scepters, oh, I think is where is my last page of notes. <laughs> uh, so we have the, the pug list. Uh, the Puglist is the world weary spirit. You guys, you're like kneeling here. Um, bandaged on bent knee, praying at the crossroads. There's the crossroads. For great strength. A black dog howls to signify that she of the earth and underworld has arrived. Present before you is the great one of magic. In the background, under the necromancers, Crescent moon. That's the same moon that you see in the necromancer or moon card. And in that background there uh, is the city of Uruk in Sumer during the Uruk period, uh, 4000 to 3100 BC. She of the earth and underworld, or Chthonia, is a reference to Hecate. Uh, though it can also be a reference to the Sumerian goddess Eresh Kegel, ruler of the underworld and lady of the great earth. Hecate Eresh Kugel associated, is associated with dogs, serpents. So Hecate Eresh Kugel is like a combined goddess that uh, is seen often in scrolls, and ancient scrolls in uh, Greek and Phoenician, I want to say. Um, associated with dogs, serpents, wreaths, keys, the herald's wand, and gold, golden sandals. Here, Hecate's dress features a tuft pattern of overlapping petals called a kaunakas. Kaunikis? Sorry, I'm totally mangling that. Um, a, a common dress style in ancient Mesopotamia. So the other reason um, why... Hecate here is shown as uh, older, as a crone, is because the original um, maiden mother crone was, uh, the maiden was Persephone, the mother was Demeter, and the crone is Hecate, the goddess of magic. Um, so uh, Pagalus is one who fights, specifically one who fights with fists. Note, uh, the bandaged hand on the kneeling man. This is one who won't back down in the face of adversity. The Pugilist is thus the spirit of great strength, powerful and potent, which can be used to defend against debility, weakening, despair, and oncoming illness. Primordial influences uh, the priestess and the angel. Numerologically, just like all four, it's the erudite and the necromancer. And 
Mather's attribution is great strength. Next, we have the nine of chalices. Oh, that's interesting. So Deanne says, uh, interesting. Second time this week, the Eldorado has come across my table. Eldorado, Texas is the actual town where Warren Jeffs built his temple and told his people that it was Zion. Interesting. That is very interesting. That cardinal is just going off out there. So here is the larger version of the image. Uh, nine chalices are arranged in a magic square. Um, inscribed upon them are the trigrams from the Bagua. Here at the top. At the top. All right, so the different trigrams. And that middle one is the one that doubles. Right? and a power cross on the center of chalice. Each chalice also, uh, also presents its corresponding astrological glyph of the sacred seven and the two lunar, lunar nodes. Oh, I see. So it's just below the trigrams. You can see the astrological signs. <laughs> Laura says apparently he's talking to the cardinal outside his window. <laughs> or window. Oh, okay. I was like, Laura, did you change your name to your real name? <laughs> In the Vedas, the Adi Prashakti is the supreme being, understood as a mother goddess, although Adi Parashakti herself has no root or no physical form. She is unmanifest with raw power. Instead, Adi Parashakti manifests through different facets of Shakti or cosmic energy forms personified. The most predominant forms of Shakti are collectively called Tridevi, the triple goddess Lakshmi, uh, Durga, who's also known as Parvati or Mahakala, and Sarasvati. To the viewer's left is uh, the beloved Lakshmi. Her long, luscious hair signifies fertility. From her right hand, she sends out gold coins of wealth and prosperity, where there is the personal trinity of willpower, work ethic, and sincerity present. Lakshmi always appears to give her blessings of abundance and security. It's so understood that Lakshmi is a personification of a primordial, otherwise intangible, natural force. The face and form of Lakshmi is a manifestation of that force. The depiction of her with four arms is to symbolize the four attributes that lead to prosperity. Dharma, being a natural life. Artha, always maintain a defined goal or purpose for the work that you're doing. Kama, to enjoy all the pleasures and senses of emotional fulfillment that the material world has to offer you. And Moksha, to ultimately strive for release from the cycle of physical suffering. The center of the triple goddess is the undefeatable Durga in the form of Parvati, the goddess of valor and divine strength, signified by her right hand forming a fist. The Shakti in her dark form as Durga personifies victory in war and battles and the power to exercise evil. The Shakti in her light form as Parvati personifies love and beauty and the power to cultivate good. From Durga arose Kali, as Kali began being the personification of Durga's wrath. In traditional depictions of Durga, she is multi-limbed, 
wielding a chakra wheel, conch, bow, arrow, sword, a javelin, shield, and or a noose, or some combination of those symbols. In this depiction, Durga is wielding a chakram, a traditional brass and or steel ring-like throwing weapon, with variants that can come up and be used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. With her right leg, she wields a trishula, the divine trident symbolic of the trinity. Durga is a protector goddess, defending to preserve all that is good and harmonious in the world. Echoing the concept of just bedam justam, or the doctrine of a just war, in Hinduism, <clears throat> this is the Dharma Yuda, a righteous war. Tridevi can be portrayed with Durga as is here, Mahakali in the form of Kali or Parvati. To the right is the goddess of knowledge, culture, and the arts, Saraswati. Here the harmony, here the har har harmonies of music and their recitations of the Vedas all around. Therasvati is also the goddess of wisdom, further hailed as the goddess of sciences and the goddess of letters. She embodies the D or imagination and creativity. Therasvati is traditionally depicted with a musical instrument such as a zither, lute, or harp on the um, she actually she does have musical instrument. Um, but we do have the scrolls. Uh, so you have four scrolls, some of the four Vedas, there is associated with the imagery of flowing water or a pool of calm waters. Furthermore, the symbology of the water is to signify sound, both the sound of music and the sound of speech, the recitation of knowledge. And I guess on the card, she doesn't have the instrument, but here in the original image, she did have the instrument. So I'm not, why, I'm not sure why I don't see it in the card unless it was just removed, so it would be easier to see the uh, cup or the chalice. Um, altogether, the three are the personif personified manifestation of fortune, power, and knowledge. Tridevi is the power to grow your prosperity through Mahalakshmi, the power to create and bring into being that which you seek through Mahasarasvati, and the power to unbind and dismantle that which has been blocking you through Mahakali. Uh, primordial influences, we have astrologically the Wheel of Life and the Necromancer, numerologically the Erudite and the Necromancer. So this is definitely connected to the moon. And Matthew's attribution is material happiness. So, um, Benavel talks about how she mixed uh, Hindu mythos with Taoist exorcisms, pairing the illustration of Trinity and the trigrams in the Bagua. Chalice is right. Next, we have the nine of Swords, the haunt. Restful sleep eludes her. She sits upright in bed, face buried in hand in a slight fetal position. Oh, sip, sip, everyone. The horn shadow Hovering over her from behind is the haunt. It's this big shadow here. Etched into the side of the figure's medieval style bed here is an astrological table of essential dignities, starting with the top row left to right after the glyph for fire is Aries, then Mars. Its planetary ruler and Venus, which is exactly detrimental in Aries. My peacocks. Mm. 
Next is Taurus, then it's planetary ruler, Venus, and then Mars, which is in detriment under Taurus, and so on. Um, the backdrop is that of a crypt underneath a medieval cathedral. The three circular seals along the left column here, I believe. Uh, co covered by the spirit of the haunt is top to bottom. The first pentacle on Mars from the key of Solomon, then Paracelsus, uh, first zodiac seal for Gemini, and then his second zodiac seal for Gemini. To the right, first is the magic ring of Solomon. from the Goeda. Below it is the AGLA, Seal of Divine Protection, from demons. And finally, the fourth pentacle of Mercury, a magical seal used to acquire knowledge, to reveal that which is hidden and to command the aleatory spirits. Mercury is a planetary ruler of Gemini, so its seal is placed here to am amplify your personal strength and fine-tune your perceptivity. So let me show you those skills a little better. They are fully in the book. So these top ones are on the left. And these bottom ones are on the right, if you have a card in front of you. Oh, I see. Okay. So the four rectangles forming the two columns um, are magical tablets for healing from the book of Aramelia and the Mage, book three, chapter 18, to heal diverse maladies with the letters written in Agrippa's celestial alphabet. Top to bottom, they are the magic square for curing disease and illness and pestilence. Uh, tablet for curing feelings of imbalance for healing a wound and to cure physical body pains. Let me show you those first two. So they, of course, they have them all here in the book. So top one, second one. third one, magic square to cure physical body pain. Okay. Here is the background free of anything in the foreground. So you can see that this square is a little better. Her suffering as called for fourth, she of the earth and underworld, great one of magic, who appears here as a matron. This is mother, though not in this motherhood that humans are more familiar with. This is a spiritual mother waking from her own solace and leaving her cave to come in at your moment of need to tend to you until your fear of the darkness, until you fear the darkness no more. The checkered tiles on the bed with the astrological glyphs represent fate, while the checkered tiles of the floor behind her, where Mother Hecate stands, is a blank representing free will. The path into the future is unwritten. The checkered tiles are a Masonic symbol of hermetic dualism. You've been feeling haunted and bound by your fate, yet Hecate now approaches you, illuminating the crypt with her torch. Through the magic cast by this card on your behalf, Though so you're in the throes of a Nine of Swords moment, divine help is on the way. Hecate is coming. That is a great Nine of Swords. Right? Uh, primordial influences, astrologically, is the Tower and the Lovers. Neurologically, like all of them, the Erudite and the Necromancer. Matthew's attribution is despair and 
Security. Mm. Ah, that doesn't sound so good. Mm. So I can to show up. I mean, there's the crown version, the mother version. And I remember Vanabel mentioning where it must have been during the this. Let me just flip back real quick to see. Where else she shows up? Um, I know I read it, I just am not finding it at the moment. Um, but yeah, uh, Hecate shows up in the deck um, as a maiden, a mother, and a crow. So we have the crown and mother here. I'm trying to remember where the maiden version. I'm not finding it. I thought it was right here in this write up, but I guess some misremembering. It might have been in um, one of the majors, now that I think about it. Oh, yeah. No, 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 I'm not. I don't know. Ah, okay, I'm going to stop wasting time. <laughs> Our uh, final nine is the nine of ores. The eminence. <clears throat> three stratified layers of scenery in this card represent Inca cosmology. The three worlds are Pacas. The Uku Pacas is the lower world of the Earth. Seven rock formations in the foreground represent Earth spirits and gateway posts to the underworld. Andean cultures believed unique rock formations were the dwelling places of important Kasonic spirits. The Cape is the surface of the earth that is the human material realm, right? Material reality. Here we see a mother with a day's work of harvest on her shoulders. The grandmother is resting and her granddaughter kneels behind her, braiding her hair. The grandmother may look world-worn, but the shaman staff by her side with three sharpened points like a weapon Hints at the formidable power she still wields. See the staff on the ground here. There's the mama, the crumb, and the maiden. The fruits that the three have gathered are Uma, Uma, a fruit native to the Andean valleys of Peru, Chile, and Ecuador. Indigenous art and archaeological artifacts dating back to the first century AD were found to feature the Lucuma as a sacred food. The Lucuma tree itself is referenced as the tree of life and symbolized abundance and prosperity. Three Vukuna animals native to the Andes and featured on Peru's coat of arms look on. Llamas, right? Along the horizon line is the Andes. The foreground features the magical flower of the Inca, the Cantua Bixifolia, also the national flower of Peru. No. You know what? I love certain things that um, Benabel does. Like, look, I always look for a snail in the nine of coins, nine of pentacles, and there's a snail right there on the rock. <laughs> oh my goodness! So 
the Hanan Pacha is the higher world above in the skies where the sun and moon are sovereign. This is the world of the starry canopy and constellations. Andean cultures within the Incan Empire believe they came from the stars and after death will return to the stars. When they look up, they're seeing their ancestors alongside their gods. Above the three generation of women is the goddess Chaska. Chaska? Chaska. Associated with Venus as a star of dawn and twilight. Maidens, princesses, fertility, abundance, dawn, morning dew. She appears in the skies to bring blessings and fortuitous things to the people below. Chaska is why flowers and fruits glow up grow a plenty. The spiral tattoo on her right arm. Focus. The spiral tattoo on her right arm means creation of humankind. The one on the left means creation of the cosmos. It is after sunset in the first hour of light from the star of Venus, grandmother rests, for her physical endurance is not what it used to be. Her granddaughter, the young maiden, tends to her, playing with grandmother's hair as she listens to her grandmother's stories of the old days. The eminence is a collective spirit. This is the spirit of what Chaska embodies, plus the three generations of women and nature in harmony. It is the esoteric principle that the four is the three, that the holy trinity of the tria prima is what begets the four elements and the four corners of the earthly plane. <clears throat> Chaska's necklace plate features the chakana known as the Incan cross. The four arms signify the four cardinal directions, though the cross is stepped and thus shows the eight. The eight represents the union of the spirit world with the material world, and the center circle is the nexus point through which the shaman transverses. A snail <laughs> in the bottom right of the frame is an homage to the Nine of Pentacles from the RWS. Oh, and here comes special needs hi what are you doing mall yeah no please don't shake the camera dude <laughs> come here you need to come down oh he's such a big boy there you go mall special needs kitty is special needs <laughs> see i get bumped too much Um, the eight represents the union of the spirit world with the material world and the center circle. Neck. Okay, I said that already. The snail is an homage to the RWS. And then the geometric rays of color light emanating from Chaska echoes the thought nine of it. Astrologically, um, the primordial influences are the Empress and the Eurydice. Numerologically, it's the Eurydice and the Necromancer. So this nine of orbs is very much connected to the Hermit. Matthew's attribution is material gain. Oh my gosh. Look at that. Done with the nines. That's so crazy. On to the tens. Uh, realm of tens is melting. Ten is the number of transformation. It is the mountain atop a peak. And now the waning or unwinding period down to repeat the cycle in another incarnation. In the Kabbalistic tree of life, the realm of tens arise from the Sephiroth Malkuth, 
emanation of the material world. It is the concentration of the four elements, fire, water, air, and earth. Malkuth comes not directly from God, but from God's creation. It is the planets and solar system. Malkuth is the tangible form of all divine emanations. It is the great potential that man is capable of, the spirits of the burdened one, the joyous one, the destroyer, and the dynasty. The Ten of Scepters is the materialized labors and trials born from Ki Ten, the Wheel of Life. Likewise, uh, Ten of Chalices is materialized happiness arising from the turn of the wheel. Ten of Swords is materialized pain when the wheel turns in the direction of destruction. The Ten of Orbs is the greatest human materialization of prosperity that is possible from the Wheel of Life. So, Ten of Scepters. The Burdened One. <clears throat> Another little step, maybe. Along the bottom third of the image, two human hands grasp onto two scepters. Eight more scepters with four crossing arms form an X balanced on top of the two which the struggling hands must have the strength to sustain. Through the slats of the crisscross scepters is the image of Atlas, the Titan who led the war against Zeus and the Olympians. And after the Titan's defeat, he was condemned by Zeus to carry the weight of the heavens upon his shoulders. At the opposite end of the parallel scepters are the hands of spirit, one red, one blue, each bearing the sigillum day or seal of God. I have the full seal here, actually. It's from John D. Sigillum de Almas or seal of God. So it's uh, So yeah, that was sourced from the 13th century grimoire, the sworn book of Honoris or Liber Juratus. Here Atlas is holding up a shima of the celestial spheres. So you can kind of see that the different spheres that the different planets are attached to. The ten spheres in the firmaments above Earth, attributed to Claudius Ptolemy in the first century AD, based on the cosmology proposed by Aristotle. The first is the sphere of the moon, the second Mercury, the third Venus, uh, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and making up the sacred seven. Above the sphere of the sacred seven is the octava sphera, or eighth sphere of the fixed stars. Um, the 12 zodiac signs anchor at four corners by the fixed signs Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. Here, the Octava Sphera is represented by three rings for the subdivision of cardinal, mutable, and fixed signs. The ninth sphere is the Primo Mobile, also a premium mobile or Primum Movens, the first clause. In medieval astronomy, this was believed to be the origins points of matter. The sphere of first cause is the intelligent design that sets the spheres below into motion. And then we have a little lot more about the, uh, here we go. And then finally, the 10th sphere beyond the Primum Mobile is Imperius or Empyrean Heaven. Here is the dwelling of pure light, the source of creation. This is the mind of God, the Greek 
etymological root of imperious is in pyros, meaning of the fire. The cosmology echoes Zoroastrian beliefs from Mesopotamia of the one true creator God. Astrologically, the Ten of Scepters connects to Key 21 New World Order through Saturn, traditionally the world card in Tarot. There is also a numerological connection to Key 10 Wheel of Life, the wheel in Bem from Postal's Key, featured in Key 10, appears as a ring around the base of each pillar in the Temple of the Cosmos. Maybe. In the distance, we see a glimpse of another solar system. One of the inner rings features a more prominent star or planet, a parallel existence to human life on Earth in our own solar system. Along the bottom right corner of the illustration are two oxen pulling the wheel of life. Ooh, those oxen are so tiny, I missed them. Teeny tiny little oxen. And of course, there's a trash truck. <laughs> Astrological influences, New World Order, the Angel, numerologically connected to the Magus, Wheel of Life, the Warrior of the All. Matthew's attribution, oppression. Feeling the weight of the universe on your shoulders, aren't you? Here is uh, just that image of Atlas. See if I had the other. Another vision of the spheres. Oh, 1559. Okay, moving on. Ten of chalices. Ten of chalices. The joyous one. In the foreground is an opulent manner, symmetrical in four directions, symbolizing fulfillment, family security, and a grounded sense of home. The glowing larger than life chalice appears in between the manor and the pagoda. The Chinese oracle bone script for luminescence or holy light is inscribed upon the center of the chalice. Right there. Focus. Kind of hard to see on this camera. Um, the pagoda symbolizes receipt of divine or specialized knowledge. In feng shui, a pagoda statue or imagery can be used to advance scholarship. A bridge in the midground, which can be used as a fishing pier, is featured in this key as an omen of spirit connections. Watching over this scene is Matsu, a much beloved Asian goddess of the seas and the protector goddess of Taiwan. Here she presents as God the Mother in her form as the Queen of Heaven, or Tian Ho, the astrological ruler from Key 18, Necromancer Pisces, and the numerological ruler from Key 1, Magus, are represented in Matsu, who was a 10th century shamanist and sorceress from the Fijian province of southern China, a Hokkien-speaking region of the mainland. She was spiritually trained under the tutelage of the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin. Uh, we get a lot more detail about her. Uh, there's two primary forms that Matsu appears in. The first is likely to be a humbler red or white Hanfu dress. When she's prey to an emergency or crisis, she comes as she is in that simple Hanfu sometimes white, sometimes outfitted with a red cloak. 
However, for ceremonies, rituals, and festivities, Matsu appears in full imperial regalia and with the accoutrements of shamaness, as she does here in the Ten of Chalices. Nine chalices appear in the sky in the formation of the alchemical glyph for water. The chalices feature in different arrangements the three blessings, Fu Lu Shu, prosperity, achievement, and longevity. Behind the chalices in spirit form are Matsu's two attendants who have shapeshifted into koi fish or carp to represent prosperity and good fortune. They are kind of faint, but you can see behind the cups the two carp swimming around each other. Here's a better there we go. Let's see. Um, one is Tian Liyuan, the one who sees all that is happening. This clairvoyance will help you to navigate anything ahead of you so that you always remain safe. The other is Shun Fenger, the one who hears all that is happening. This clairaudience will give you a complete sense of scope for your present. Uh, in Chinese lore, there's a mystical waterfall where if a koi fish can swim against the rushing waves upward and reach the top of the waterfall, that fish will transform into a dragon. The theme of the story is earned success that will endure. Also in Chinese lore, the rainbow was thought to be a celestial dragon or serpents in the skies. The docked boats by the rocky shores are a homage to the fishing and island communities that venerate her. Matsu has always been of particular importance to those whose livelihoods depend on the sea. Good for me here in Hawaii, right? So the reason why there's all these reds against the blue is uh, Mars and Pisces, represents Mars and Pisces. And the twin koi fish are also reminiscent of the Piscean influence. Um, then we get a big talk about the different structures. Here's the background without any foreground. Um, I think we need to get into the everything. Um, so this bottom chalice, of course, is the ace of chalices, right? Um, promoted influences for this card, astrologically, the tower, the necromancer, numerologically, the magus, wheel of life, the warrior. Mather's attribution is perpetual success. Ten of swords. My boys are home, so it's going to be a little noisy in the background. Sorry for that. A shamanist channels the destroyer of obstacles. We are seeing her physical and spiritual forms merging, and so she appears with six arms. She stands over a slain, prostrate figure, clothes in the colors of Malkuth the Kabbalistic correspondence for the tens. The figure's right hand is the... Uh, uh, symbol of benediction, symbolic of the great authority the slain figure had held. In Taoist magic, this hand mudra is the sword or pen indicating one who commands the spiritual world. Adorned on the left hand, fourth finger, is a ring of sovereignty. In medieval times, it was believed that a vein ran from the fourth finger of the left hand straight to the heart. 
Bene Amoris, in the vein of love. The shamaness is wearing a Mongolian deal robe, a traditional clothing style of Central Asia. The one depicted here, characteristic of several Mongolian tribes, is made of silk and brocade with accents of fleece. The specific style presented here is inspired by deals from the 14th and 15th centuries. Mm. What are you doing? Can you please? Mm. Oh my God. Yeah. Behind the shamaness is an obo, also obo, a shrine. Let's see here. Let me show you the bigger version. A shrine or altar consisting of stones and wood formed into a mound and consecrated, constructed at the top of a hill or mountain. Blue kadag or ceremonial scarves tied to tree branches are left in the obo as offerings to Tengri, the sky god. According to Mongolian tradition, when you encounter an ovo along your journey, stop and walk a circle around the ovo three times clockwise. This blesses you with good luck and protection. Likewise, when the Ten of Swords appears in your reading, encountered along your spiritual journeys, press your second and third fingers together side by side and trace a circle around the card going clockwise three times, reciting the following three times. Great heavens, protect me and safeguard me from treachery. Great heavens, protect me and safeguard me from treachery. Five swords are stabbed in the prostrate figure, right to left. The first pierces the jade pillow chakra point or cranial pump, which the energetic point of psychic transmissions. Next is the, that'll be this one. Next is the wing point or point opposite heart, the hub of spiritual emotional development. The third is the adrenal point, the governing physical vitality. Fourth is the door of life across uh, from the sacral chakra, which is the master energy uh, switch for karma, fate, and destiny that was prenatal. Fifth, which the shamaness holds in her right hand, is the area of the sacral pump and the gate of life and death, the region of the root chakra. The sacral pump works in tandem with the cranial pump which the shamaness holds in her left hand. This is the hub of willpower, determination, and drive. Left to right, the gemstones on the hilts are the color corresponding for the Wu Shi, or five forces in Eastern metaphysics. Green for wood, red for fire, yellow for gold, yellow gold for earth, white silver for metal, and blue for water. And there's a close up of those swords so you can see that those gems are really small little specks mm -hmm. um um On the sword penetrating the figure's wing point, uh, opposite point of the heart, is a coiled serpent from uh, resembling Dion's rat snake, or Alfe Dion, a snake commonly found in Mongolia and northern China. Dion was an ancient Greek titaness and mother to Aphrodite. According to the Fabulae in the first century Latin writer Gaius Julius Hyginius, Dion is the daughter of Gaia and Aether. Uh, a sixth sword lies on the ground under the figure. Hovering behind the shamaness are four more swords for a total of 10. These swords are fashioned after medieval Turco-Mongol sabers. We have twin war drums on either side of the shamaness, a red cord tied around the hoop of the drum on the right, and a green cord around the drum on the left. The face of the drum features the Tangrist magic square from the 
Oh, I don't even know if I'm going to try and say that. Emin Haptoman Sirdar, a treasy on magical medicine, a Mongolian Buddhist grimoire. So here's a better image of the drums. We get more about Mongolian shamanism if you have the book. I feel like we should you know, dally on the like super major details. I know it's supposed to be a deep dive, but there's only so much time. And this is like, this deck could be one of those decks you can end up studying for the rest of your life, right? Um, there's a big, big conversation about uh, Tibetan and Mongolian shamanism, what shamanism means. So that's like a whole other hour on its own, I think. Um, so this card, uh, primordial influences astrologically the warrior, the lovers, numerologically the magus, wheel of life, and the warrior. Mather's attribution is ruin. So the destroyer spirit might initially feel ominous, but it represents a spiritual catharsis. Catharsis uh, is a sense of purging, of purification. Um, this is the spirit of ruin, which means the destruction or dismantling of that which has been institutionalized. Powerful constructs fail. That which for quite some time had been enjoying glory and stability now enter decay and head towards destruction. What had been perceived by others as pristine is now soiled. Um, let's see. Ten of Swords can also be a sign of toxic positivity. Someone in your life is enabling you or encouraging you not to stand up for yourself or allowing your own bad behavior to continue. This is also an omen that you are to be a disruptor, but influential members of society are trying to hold you back. Disruptors facilitate progress and change, but at the cost of peace and perhaps even short term prosperity. Our 78th card, we have the Ten of Orbs, the Dynasty. The setting is Manden Kurufaba, the Mali Empire in West Africa, 14th century in Timbuktu. This reimagined Timbuktu features Sudanu Sahelian architect, architectural styles, the signature of West African region. These adobes were made of mud brick, supported by horizontal logs of wood that jutted from the outer facade, facades, serving as support beams for multi-story construction, an earthen architectural style dating as far back as 20, 250 BC, per archaeological records from the old towns of Djene and Mali. Here was the golden age of trans-Saharan commerce and prosperity. In medieval times, Timbuktu was a cosmopolitan center for trade where scholarship, science, and mathematics flourished. Salt, ivory, gold, and copper made this center wealthy beyond comprehension. Goods from Europe, Central Asia, India, and as far as China were found here. Timbuktu's golden age was an era of political, philosophical, and intellectual advancement predating Europe's Age of Enlightenment by three centuries. In the foreground, uh, the, the old man faces the young man. It is inheritance, legacy, and the multi-generational dynasty. The young faces the day. <laughs> so much noise. Mm. Um, the young man faces the day. Yeah, right. The old man faces the night. 
Though the men pictured here are ruling class nobles from the Mali Empire, they were wearing 14th century Indian inspired clothing. At the time, Timbuktu traded directly with Gujarat and India for silks and fine cottons. The more cosmopolitan among the wealthy in Mali were inspired by the fashions and styles of the Delhi Sultanate. Being able to wear exotic imported threads was a show of your status and prestige. Uh, the 10 orbs are arranged in the Kabbalah tree of life. Uh, and the orbs are connected by the Ari paths. The Ari tree of life is sourced from Ha'ari, the lion, born Isaac, and Solomon, Loria, Ashkara, 1534 to 1572. Okay, let's move on. Ah, okay, here we have a five petaled Adrocarpus mondii flower, a rare yellow savanna blossom native to the region of Mali. Historically, divining or dowsing for fresh water sources was linked to the flower because where the yellow flower could be found growing, an underground water source was near. It symbolizes fertility of the earth and the promise of prosperity. Um, the background horizontal line, horizontal, horizon, no, 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 I'm just trying to lose it, sorry guys, <laughs> oh, Tony, yes, uh, the flower name is, I will just show you here, Acridocarpus mon monodii, I totally mangled that, didn't I? Mm. That peacock's laughing at me. <laughs> um, so let's show you the background without the foreground here. So you see the sun and the moon, and then there's the arch, right? Um, The hand of Fatima. Oh, that's this rock formation. Okay. I was like, wait, where's the hand? I'm looking for a hand. No, there's no hand. It, because it is the, that's what this rock formation is called. Sorry. Um, iconic rock formation in the region resembling fingers reaching. Oh, I see. It's the rock formation back in there. Um, it's also the name of an amulet for protection from the evil eye, popular found across Mediterranean East. The nine etchings on the stone archway are from Crowley's thought ten of discs. The center keystone features a mystic pyramid of Mercury's numerology. Eight, forty-six, two, sixty, twenty. To the left is the uh, hexagram, and to the right, an octagram. Oh, wow, there's a lot to this. <laughs> Let's bring that up a little. That's hard. To the hexagrams left is the Hebrew letter for Beth, corresponding to Q1, the Magus, which corresponds with Mercury. To the octagrams right is the John D's, a Nokian letter P, or P E, an equivalent to Beth. To Beth's left is a Caduceus formed from the three mother letters Alf, center of Caduceus, Mem, bottom, and Shin. To the right of Pe'e is the Hebrew name for Archangel Raphael. Then on either side are octagrams encircling gold coins of prosperity. Near the middle of the two archway pillars is the hexagram, hexagon composite. Huh. 
there's a lot to unpack in these cards, isn't there? Um, so primordial influences, uh, astrologically, the magus, the erudite, numerologically, the magus, wheel of life, the warrior. So this 10 of orbs is very connected to the mage card, isn't it? Matthew's attribution is wealth. Oh, you're okay, Maul. I know you heard people leave and now you're upset because you're not sure what's going on. Um, So Ten of Orbs is the final card of this seven lower realms in the minor arcana, and so it symbolizes a sum total. To mark its significance, the whole figure of the Tree of Life is depicted on the card. That depiction is found in both the Rider Waite Smith and the Thoth to convey the significance of this card's positioning. The dynastic or the dynasty absorbs and is the sum total of all the work that has been done from the beginning. Therefore, it is in it is drawn the very figure of the tree of life itself, Crowley. Just as the Ten of Orbs is the final card in the Seven Lower Realms, Key 21, the Tarot World card, is the final card of the final Sepentary in the Majors, and the Three of Orbs is the final card in the Seven Upper Realms. Thus, these three keys, when linked, reveal the secrets to high achievement and greatness. Let me put those together. Yes, it is. Last of the majors, the last of the um, non ports, uh, upper seven, and the last of the lower seven. Okay, so that is the end of the cards. Wow, cannot believe. Aloha, Tony. Thank you for being here. Oh, mom. So the other thing I wanted to mention real quick, um, the cards also have trigrams attached on the lower left-hand corner. Right. I am now going to have to shuffle my cards, which have been like in order for so long, it's going to be good to shuffle them again. Um, and we are going to talk a little bit about how this deck can be used for the team readings. So um, if you want to do a simple uh, pull for the day, I would suggest um, doing this in a way where you can not only get a tarot reading, but also a um, I Ching reading. So what Benabelle suggests is that uh, instead of drawing a single card for the day, you draw two. Um, the first one is going to be the bottom triagram of the hexagram. So the triagrams are eight triagrams, and the combination of them create the 64 hexagrams. Right? Um, and you can actually, even if you don't have the big book of maps, you can um, use the little white book in order to um, figure out the trigrams or figure out what um, hexagram your trigrams are forming. So I'm just going to shuffle a few more times because this was in perfect order. So I'm going to make sure we get a good shuffle. And then we'll do a couple examples real quick before I uh, give myself a little break before I go live again in about half an hour with Betsy. And I will be using this deck for our readings today and uh, on our usual Psychic Play Date. Okay, 
let's do a quick little reading unless someone has one that they want to use as an example easy example um, i'm open um, otherwise i'll just pull a generic one right? and it is it usually works best with a very specific question um, but we can just make up a question right? make up a scenario and see what the cards now, of course you know the cards are going to know we're making things up that's why i'm like does anyone out there have something okay let us do a quick what would i want to know let me shuffle again while i'm thinking um What will be the uh, central theme of my vacation that starts a week from tomorrow? We're going to California and Belize, and I feel like the trip to Belize is going to be a very amazing spiritual thing. So let's see. What do the guys have to say about this trip? So, the joyous one, the Ten of Chalices, I love that. I did not shuffle enough, apparently, because I got <laughs> the Ten of Chalices and the Ten of Swords. Is the next one a Ten? No, it's not. Okay, well, um, I guess that's what we're doing. The joyous one and the destroyer. Interesting. Um, so... The very back of the little white book, you have the eight trigrams there to look for here, right? I am just going to use the book because it's a little bigger, so it'll show up. Um, so here, so um, in Taoist thought, everything is split into two, right? The yin and the yang of each thing. Um, and here we have, so the two fires, we've got fire and thunder. The two waters are water and wind. The two airs are heaven and lake, and the two earths are earth and mountain. Okay. So we look at the first card, and we compare. It looks like we have wind. Okay. And lake. So the way this is done, the first one is going to be the bottom trigram of the hexagram, and the second one is going to be the top. Um, the little white book does have this thing where you did lower trigram, upper trigram, so you can look it up that way. Um, you're not going to have any write-ups for the hexagrams in here, so you can um the thing i really like about the book version in here is we have well that's, they break it down into like which cards belong to which right um the Ching and true correspondences right and then here is the amazing one okay this is a chart where you can find any of them so our first one, the lower trigram, right, was wind here, okay? So our upper one was lake. So we'd go here. So our trigram, is gonna, our hexagram is going to be 28 great courts. 28. And so... Benabel created this amazing write-up for each one. That's pretty much all you really need. If you want to get a little more in-depth, there are some great I Ching books out there, but you do have to be careful about... Um, some of them are not really translated that well, and um, they don't go by the system. They, they kind of create their own system in a way, right? So um, you... 
I would just um, do a little research on what books would be the best. I'm blanking on specific authors at the moment because my brain just doesn't want to work. Um, but I, I, will, I will try and find some and um, if I remember, put it in the comments below or the description below. I have a few videos where I said I would put something in the description. I don't think I ever did. I mean, comb through my videos, which I never watch. So I'll try and fix that. So anyway, so 28. We have lake over wind. Okay. 28 is undertaking the great tipping point excessive force. You are the sage who stands independent and fierce without fear, renouncing the world you knew. It is a tipping point. You are reaching critical mass, embarking on a great endeavor. You may need to use excessive personal force. You are on a path of transformation. To facilitate that transformation, excessive force may be necessary, though by the laws of nature, there are consequences to the use of excessive force. It is a turning point in your life. A dried poplar yields one final blossom its last great act before the popular withers. Wow. And then each one also has a breakdown of upper trigram lake. What would it be? Lower trigram wind. Right. Ten of chalices, ten of swords. Okay, so just as I thought, I feel like this is, um, this trip is going to be a, a turning point for me. Like, I'm going to get to experience one of my dreams come true, and that is um, exploring Mayan ruins. And not just that, but I get to actually to, um, the ATM cave, which uh, is the, according to National Geographic, National Geographic, the number one holiest cave in the world. Um, and it's still filled with Mayan artifacts and Mayan um, sacrifices. Uh, several of the uh, skeletons have um, crystallized. There's actually the Crystal Maiden is the best, um, best preserved skeleton there. And um, it, it, I feel like it's going to be one of these rites of passage because part of it is like you're going to be walking like chest high water to get through into the cave because the cave has a river that runs through it and occasionally the water comes up and down. And so that's why you can only go with a trained tourist or tour guide. Um, so I feel like I just like the trip itself is all amazing and everything, but Ever since I heard that we're going to that ATM cave, that kind of, I feel echoes of that already happening. Like, you know how certain spiritual events echo forward and backwards? Well, I'm feeling some of those backward echoes before it's even happened. So I feel like something, it's a turning point, right? A tipping point, just like this trigram said. And the other thing Benamil talks about as far as using the trigrams, um, is then once you figure out that turning point and then you read it with the cards, right? So we have the Ten of Chalices, that, that ultimate happiness card, right? With the Ten of Swords, finally giving up, right? Letting those thoughts take you out, but it's, it's the beginning, it's something new, right? So I think in a way it's gonna be an incredible experience. So, yes, Deanne. Mm -hmm. So that is my deep dive into the Spirit Keepers Tarot Revelation Edition. I hope you found it helpful. Um, it's been uh, an amazing journey. I can't believe it's already over, even though it felt like it was never going to end when I was in the middle of it. Um, but yes, this is an amazing deck, um, crammed full of information from the entire world. And it's definitely going to be one of those decks. I feel like it's going to take a lifetime to master all the knowledge packed 
into each individual card. Um, obviously, I will be referencing this book quite a lot. And now that uh, the deep dive is finally over, I am pulling out the journal um, so that I can start working and doing like a true deep dive for myself. Um, the journal is set up so that you have weekly rituals um, and it's set up so there's a section for Mondays, a section for Tuesdays, a section for Wednesdays, and each day has a specific um, thing or reading, right? And then there's spreads. Uh, there's a log for daily card drawings. There's a log for tarot readings. Um, the thing that I am really, really excited about is the correspondence tables that are in here. So in the journal, there is quite a lot of just information by itself in here. That is pretty amazing. And there's a lot of it, a lot, a lot of information. So if you get a chance, I would also pick up the journal. It has, um, uh, it, I don't know, just the way it's set up, it will really help you dive super deep. You get deeper write-ups for the different Sephiroth. Um, let's see what else. Numerological correspondences in here. Uh, medical astrology in Tarot. Um, the, uh, the 22 majors with the 22 letters, Hebrew and Phoenician. I mean, there's just so much, so much information, right? I mean, look at, I mean, you get like full write-ups of the ones that are all connected. It's just, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's kind of hard to even explain how much is in here because most of it is just blank for you to write, but at the same time, there's just like, it's like, I need another hour just to talk about this stuff. But the other thing is you also get the hexagram chart for finding your hexagram. And then there's a ton of empty notes, just like blank note pages in the back. So those are the correspondences. They, they're not in the book of maps. They're not in the little book. So I feel like to really get everything that you can out of this deck, you really need both the books as well. So uh, Tony says, thank you, Jonathan. What an amazing series to have to go back and revisit. It's true. And now that I have done it uh, finished, I am tempted to watch it back myself with my deck in front of me. And um, yeah, I look forward to playing with this deck now that I really like dive deep. It changed how I see some cards even other decks. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Benabelle, for creating this masterpiece. And I look forward to our Q&A July uh, 31st, I believe. It's a Saturday. Um, I will double check that. My phone is the other camera. So uh, thank you, everyone. And I will see you in about 15 minutes for readings with Betsy. Aloha, and I'll see you soon. Bye.